Good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Challoner. I'm the president and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you uh, this morning to our uh, public awareness event about tick-borne diseases. And I will be introducing a, a wonderful panel of presenters. Uh, people have been working with us on our tick-borne disease resource center at the hospital for a number of uh, number of years now and have graciously given of their time, not only today, but at multiple events throughout, the, uh, throughout our region. A um, little bit of background for all of you about the Tick-Borne Disease uh, Resource Center at Southampton Hospital. Our physicians, a number of years ago, and particularly in our emergency room, began telling us about the influx of patients that we were seeing in the hospital. Um, uh, people coming in not only to have ticks removed, but with uh, various diseases. Um, uh, and not just uh, the disease we always hear about, Lyme disease. And uh, through discussion with our medical staff, um, realized that there was a need um, for uh, something, that the hospital had to do something for the, uh, for the community, um, because it seems to be a, a growing issue for, for this uh, community on the East End. Um, and I've said this at past um, events, and I will say it again, that I believe that what we are seeing is a public health crisis, um, that the amount of tick exposure to tick-borne diseases is increasing um, throughout, our, um, throughout our region. And it's very unfortunate because it's a, it's a community that thrives on the outdoor life. Um, and we want people outdoors and en enjoying our environment and yet they are increasingly being exposed to, uh, to, to ticks. Um, so the hospital felt that um, there were three things. If, if we approach it from the perspective of a public health uh, crisis, the most important way to combat any public health issue is through better education. Um, and we heard stories of people talking about their, their home cures for tick-borne diseases. Um, their, their, uh, some friend told them how to remove a tick um, in ways that, frankly, were unsafe and likely to complicate. Um, so we began with the notion that we need to get better education out. Um, so from that, those discussions, the Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center was born a number of years ago with really three, uh, three missions. Um, mission number one is to, um, is to educate, um, and educate not only the public and get you the best evidence-based research, and we, strike, uh, we stress that, that nothing our speakers will, will focus on is, uh, is not backed up by, um, by good research, um, research um, from, uh, from university settings um, and trying to avoid the sort of fad things that we hear out there. So we want to make sure that we get you good access to good information. We also want to make sure that we get our clinicians. Many of our own nurses and doctors were asking questions, what do I do? What is, what is this? What is this new disease we're hearing about? So in addition to public sessions like the one we're having today, um, every year we have a number of sessions that are specifically for physicians and nurses and clinicians where they can ask questions and get into the science of what we're learning about uh, tick-borne diseases. Um, and we're also making sure that we're staying current because I, I'm a lay person, but I certainly have realized that over the last um, number of sessions, and I've been to a lot of them, um, that the, the, the research is growing, and frankly, it's a much more complicated um, field than I think many of us realize. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about, about that today. So education is an important part of what we're doing. Um, number two, we want to um, help you get resources. We decided against the notion of trying to create just one single point center um, where people would go for treatment, but rather learn about all the resources that are out in our community and elsewhere and create um, navigator services. And we do have, um, we established a helpline, 631-726-TIC, that's 8425. Um, and that is staffed by an excellent, um, well-trained nurse, Rebecca Young. Young. I'm hoping she'll be, in, she's here today. Rebecca's in the back of the room. Hi, Rebecca. 
Um, Rebecca is taking calls um, from all over our region, frankly all over the country, and we've even had calls from Australia um, looking for help, help and advice. So Rebecca's job is to get, uh, get people to, to the appropriate, appropriate experts. And then finally, um, we felt that we could help support the research efforts that are going on to try and combat this, uh, this issue. Um, and you'll hear from one of our speakers today about some of the research we are supporting locally. We are not doing the research, but we are supporting the research. Um, we're certainly a hotbed for people who have been exposed to ticks, and, and good research requires research subjects. And we've been working with a number of universities, including Stony Brook, to, to further their, their research goals. Um, so those are the three missions that we set out to accomplish. In the time frame that we've been in place, um, in the last year we took 428 calls on our tick line. That was a 46% increase. This year, I've, I understand, we were already in the first few months of the year ahead of last year's entire year numbers. And this is a very, very bad year. You'll hear about that from one of our, one of our speakers. I thought it was um, uh, my own personal story I'll share about two weeks ago, or no, about a month ago I was bitten by a tick, found it in the middle of my back, and about two weeks ago my partner noticed a rash blossoming across my back, so I'm actually on doxycycline as we speak, so I have a very personal uh, uh, um, you know, exposure to, to, these, uh, to these diseases. We are all, we were all uh, uh, running into it. Um, We've started outreach to the adult community. Um, we started in February this year. We've already done 25 events for adults. And we're reaching hundreds of residents and visitors. Um, we also have a very significant outreach to kids with a program called TickWise, sponsored by um, uh, Brian Kelly, who has been very, very supportive of our efforts of East End Tick and Mosquito Control. And Brian, um, we've been working with a teacher, April Boitano, who's developed a um, curriculum to teach children. Um, and we've been out into the schools and trying to reach, uh, reach all of our children in the area to educate them about tick, tick exposure. Um, we've got a number of resources for you, which we'll hand out um, at the end of the program, the um, uh, educational materials. We also have a tick kit, which our generous donors have been supporting. Please take one, bring it home. Learn how to remove a tick correctly. You'll hear um, that that is absolutely the best, uh, the best thing. You will eventually, if you live out here and spend any time outdoors, be exposed to a tick, and hopefully uh, you will learn how to remove the tick, uh, tick correctly. Um, <clears throat> Those tick kits are free. Everything we are doing is, is uh, free of charge. We believe that this is something that it's our, our mission and, and, uh, and part of what the hospital needs to do to be out there helping, helping you. Um, we will, of course, and I will make a pitch, anybody that wants to write us a check and support our efforts with this, we are very happy to accept those. It does take, it does take money. Our speakers are, are donating their time. Um, but developing the education materials and, and, and supporting this effort does take money. So if anybody is so moved, please feel free to, um, please feel free to uh, help our efforts. And now what I'd like to do is introduce our, our speakers. And we do have a wonderful panel for you today. Um, <clears throat> and we'll go in order of the agenda. We will ask... Um, uh, each of the speakers to speak, and we will save questions until the end. Um, so there are, I believe, pads and pens here. If you think of a question, just write it down, and then we will have ample question and answer opportunity at the end, and we'll talk about that when, the, when each of them are, are done speaking. So let me introduce our first panelist. It's Dr. Scott Campbell. Uh, Scott Campbell is a medical entomologist who received a Bachelor of Science from Muhlenberg College and a PhD from Cleveland State University. Currently, Dr. Campbell is the laboratory chief of the Arthropod Born Disease Laboratory for the Suffolk County Department of Health Services and has been involved in public health and research of arthropod born diseases for approximately 25 years. He and his staff are responsible for countywide surveillance for all mosquito-borne and tick-borne pathogens that cause human disease. Dr. Campbell is a member of various professional organizations, enjoys presenting at professional meetings, and has contributed to the scientific peer-reviewed literature. Dr. Campbell. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the entomology of ticks and, uh, and the tick-borne pathogens. And uh, it's important to kind of understand ticks and, and the pathogens they carry to, to better prevent tick bites, as well as to make medical uh, decisions on how, how to uh, treat possibly or what you may be exposed to. So hopefully it will go well. So in Suffolk County, uh, or on the East End, there are basically three tick species that have the, are of medical importance. The first one is the black-legged tick, or uh, also known as the deer tick, Exodia scapularis. Uh, the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis. And the third and newest comer to uh, Suffolk County is the Lone Star tick, or Amblyoma americanum. So the life cycle of a tick is basically um, from egg to larva to nymph to adult. And it takes about two years for these ticks to go through that life cycle. And obviously between each um, stage, they need a blood meal. And they ingest that blood meal and they molt into the next stage. Adults, uh, that's they, they don't survive past the adult, they die. Uh, the males mate and the females lay eggs to uh, um, create, obviously, the, the next stage, which will be uh, the larvae, and continue the life cycle. So <clears throat> ticks, they, they don't drop from trees, they don't fly, they don't jump. They, all they do is they come up from the ground, uh, from the leaf litter, whether it's on vegetation or on the leaves, but they quest. And the questing is basically where they put their front legs out and they wait for a host to come by. Some are more aggressive with uh, questing. Some will actually pursue, like uh, Lone Star ticks will actually, uh, um, if they uh, catch a, a CO2 plume from exhalation from you or your dog or cat or uh, deer, they will pursue that and they can walk up to several yards to, uh, to a, a potential host for a blood meal. But again, they just, they come from the ground, not from uh, above. So the blood fe feeding, as I said, uh, serves two purposes, uh, nourishing so they, they can molt to the next stage or uh, for the females, it allows them to uh, create the egg mass and, uh, and lay the eggs, which are generally about two to 4,000 eggs are typically laid by an engorged female. So this is the black-legged tick. And as I said, uh, this, the four, uh, three stages are there. The larva, which is, emerges from the egg. The larva feeds, molts into the nymph, the nymph feeds and molts into the adults. So the larva and the nymph of all tick species are asexual, whereas the adults obviously mate um, and the eggs are laid. So this is a lot of peaks, but what, what it shows is when the different stages are active. And you can see that for the black-legged or deer tick, they are active all year long. So you can be um, bitten by a deer tick at any time during the year. Uh, adults come out in the fall, and they basically are gone by the spring. And they are active whenever the deg degree day is above 40 degrees. But you can have microclimates, too. So you, the, the temperature outside can be 35, but on a south-facing slope, it can be 40 or 45. So Typically, uh, you know, it will be active when those temperatures are around 40, um, and then we obviously are subjected to uh, possible uh, exposure to uh, that, this tick species. So <clears throat> the pathogens that they uh, carry, they, uh, they carry quite a few. Um, the first one is Borrelia burgdorferi, or the agent that causes Lyme disease, and I've just I'm not going to go too into much detail about these pathogens, but I just wanted you all to know what they carry. But almost everybody knows the spirochete. Um, the other one is human granulocytic anaplasmosis or anaplasmophagocytophilum. Um, again, this is a bacterium. 
just like uh, the, the spirochete and uh, as being a, a bacterium. Uh, babesiosis, however, uh, Babesia microti is actually a protozoan, very much like malaria. So you have the uh, symptoms much like malaria with the fever, episodic fever. And then uh, the one that's been around for a while, but currently uh, in the press and everybody's talking about is Powassan virus. Um, this virus is found in Suffolk County and in the, uh, the um, black-legged ticks and uh, ver at very low uh, rates. And uh, that's why we don't see it in the humans as much. But um, again, that's uh, a virus. So the life cycle, uh, the host, the primary host for the black-legged or deer tick are the white-footed mouse and, and the juvenile ticks typically feed on the, um, the mice. The mouse is the reservoir for those pathogens. So they have to feed on a white-footed mouse to pick up uh, Borrelia burgdorferi or anaplasma um, or Powassan, the, the, the pathogens that I talked about. So they need to feed on those mice. They have to be infected. Um, to uh, gain that pathogen. So if it's a larva that feeds on an infected mouse, the, that infected larva molts into an infected nymph, feeds on an uninfected mouse, and can infect that mouse. So it's kind of a, a tennis match back and forth between mouse and tick to increase the infection rates of those pathogens. The, the uh, deer are important, they're like the keystone species for the life cycle. The adults primarily feed on deer, so um, they're important for driving the population levels, not the pathogens, but the population's levels. Where you don't have a lot of deer, you have lower tick populations. So the American dog tick, um, this is a male on the left, female on the right, and um, they, they, they've been around for quite a while, those that, that have lived here for uh, decades. This was the tick that, that was in the 70s and 80s. And uh, I'll explain why that there's been a slight change in that. But the, the, the things to remember with this tick is that the juveniles are very, very restrictive to biting rodents. So you rarely have uh, larvae and nymphs biting humans of this tick species. So it's the larger ones easily found. Obviously, the larger the tick, the easier it is to find when it comes to tick checks. And they, they come out in spring, and probably m m by July, August, they're, they're gone. So they're the ones that come out in, in April that uh, a lot of people will find um, if they're in, their, in that kind of habitat, which we'll talk about. They, they are vectors are primarily two pathogens, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Rickettsia rickettsii, um, and again, that the, the number of cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever are going down because this tick is, uh, the population is going down. Tularemia, it's also a competent vector of tularemia. Again, both of those are bacteria. <clears throat> now this tick feeds on metavoles, um, and that is the competent reservoir for Rickettsia rickettsii. So again, very similar life cycle, but different hosts that, that, are, that are reservoirs where they're able to hold those pathogens in their, in their body. Um, they just circulate in the blood. There's no ill effect to the, to the uh, rodent. And uh, they kind of live uh, in a, a happy symbiotic relationship. Um, all those three components, the tick, the rodent, and the pathogen. So uh, juveniles feed on the rodents, as I said. The adults feed on canids, uh, or um, uh, yeah, canids like fox, dogs, humans, some other uh, um, hosts as well, but typically fox. So the next tick is the lone star tick, uh, Amblyomma americanum. Now these are important. All four stages will bite humans. Um, and uh, larva, nymph, and the uh, two adults. So if you look at the activity of these, of, of this species rather, the um, nymphs and adults come out in the spring, about the same time that the American dog tick comes out. Um, and so you can see that double line in the, in the beginning. Now in the summer, uh, the larvae start to come out. And this is what uh, is 
uh, referred to as chiggers, which is a misnomer. Chiggers are actually a mite that we don't have uh, biting people on Long Island. But so if you have those red rashes in, the, in August and in the early fall, you're, you're being bitten by the larval lone star tick. The tick uh, bites, drops off those red bumps. There's nothing under them. It's a reaction to the bite. So if, you know, some, I've heard some people, they treat it, they, they put something over top to, to suffocate the chigger. That's incorrect. It, there's nothing there but the bite. The tick is long gone. And oftentimes you'll find ticks when they feed, you'll find them in bed. They'll, they'll drop off when, when something's resting, whether it's a human or a dog, you'll find them in dog beds. So the uh, pathogens associated with uh, the uh, Lone Star Tick is uh, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, or human monocytic ehrlichiosis, again, another bacterium. Uh, Southern Tick associated rash illness. Um, at one time, they thought it was Borrelia Lone Starii, another spirochete, very similar to Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, they've kind of backed off of that. They, they, they see the rash after uh, bites from Lone Star Ticks, but they're unsure exactly uh, the pathogen. Um, and then they are also competent uh, transmitters of tularemia, Francisella tularensis, another bacterium. Now, the Lone Star ticks are a little different. They really prefer deer on all stages if they're not biting a human. They will bite uh, deer. So larvae, nymphs, and adults are very dependent on deer. And so, again, where we have healthy, uh, large deer populations, we generally will have uh, healthy, large uh, Lone Star Tick populations. Uh, Lone Star Tick started on the East End around Montauk in the 70s, maybe a little earlier, um, and have been slowly moving west, and their, their border is between, between Babylon and Huntington currently. Um, and so what they're following is the uh, growing deer herd. The deer are, are moving west as well, and uh, following it are the uh, Lone Star ticks, as well as the uh, deer ticks. And also the deer are the reservoir for uh, Ehrlichia chaffiensis. So again, the tick habitat, I, I alluded to this earlier, um, it's very important because you, you have to kind of understand where these ticks are going to be um, to prevent tick bites. So, Black legged or deer ticks, they prefer woodland areas because they like moist um, leaf litter. So they, they need to rehydrate frequently. They're not very, uh, they're, they're prone to desiccation. So if you keep your yard uh, sunny and dry, the chances of finding lone, uh, deer ticks in, your, in a dry, sunny yard are a lot lower than some of the other ticks that, are, uh, that um, don't have a problem with desiccation. So you find them in the woodlands. Now, the American dog tick is a meadow vole. They prefer, wood, um, they prefer meadows or uh, uh, grasslands where the meadow vole is. And if, if uh, again, you've been around Suffolk County for a while, a lot of those meadows are now either secondary growth forests or homes. And so we've seen a big change, an ecological change, with regards to um, the meadows that used to be in Suffolk County, and that's why we're seeing fewer and fewer Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases, because we're seeing an ec ecological change and fewer American dog ticks. Now, the Lone Star Tick, they love it all. They, they can be found anywhere. They can be found in uh, woodlands, grasslands, uh, that secondary uh, growth, uh, disturbed growth, and even on your back porch. I mean, they'll, they'll come into your your pool area, they'll come into, again, they're the, they're the uh, active hunters. So they'll come in, if they can sense a CO2 plume, they will actually come on your porch or on your pool deck or uh, you know, on your uh, lawn chair that's sitting in the backyard. But uh, they're, not, they're not prone to desiccation, so they can be uh, um, found anywhere. So as I said, it's important to understand the, the entomology to try to prevent. Right, we, don't, we know they don't come from the, the uh, trees. So they come from the ground. You want to create a barrier uh, to prevent tick bites. And there's two ways to prevent barriers. One is clothing, and the other is repellents. So if by, um, 
by dressing properly, long, long pants, uh, long sleeves, um, and then maybe treating those either uh, treating those clothes with repe uh, repellents and uh, maybe exposed skin with repellents. You you have those two barriers. Obviously, the best way to avoid ticks is stay out of the tick territory, right? But you know that's no fun sitting in front of the TV 24 hours a day, right? You got to get out there and enjoy um, the the wilds that uh, Suffolk County has to provide. So. You, you, wanna, you wanna stay away from that brush and that leaf litter, like I had said. So when you walk on the trail, don't, don't veer off the trail, stay in the center, because again, you're creating a, a barrier between you and where that, those ticks will be found. Um, obviously, you don't throw a picnic uh, blanket down in the middle of uh, uh, tick territory. You pick a bench or something like that. Um, you know, again, when any kids in the in the yard, you want to make sure that they stay out of those areas. Uh, any kind of play areas, uh, you want to avoid any kind of habitat. Uh, I, the most important thing is frequently check for ticks. You check while you're out in um, tick territory, and you check when you're back home, and you check the following morning because oftentimes what you'll see is uh, a tick attached the following morning where you didn't see it before. Uh, it may not even have been on you. Maybe it was on something that you took with you, you moved it that night, and now it's, now it's on you, okay? Or it's, it was on a piece of clothing you threw on your bed. So you, you need to, re to do frequent checks even the day after. Um, obviously, remove them promptly. Um, Puasin can be transmitted within about 15 minutes, but most of the bacterial infections take a, approximately 24 to 36 hours. So it's, it's very, very important to remove ticks as quickly as possible uh, to prevent any kind of transmission from pathogens. Um, another good thing is anything that you wear outside, when you bring it home, put it directly in the dryer. Don't put it in the, in the clothes washer. They survive uh, the clothes washer. I've done experiments with hot water, Clorox, um, detergent, everything, and they survive. So, you know, again, you throw it in the, in, the, in the clothes washer, you reach in to pull it out, they're alive still. So you want to throw it right in the dryer for 10 minutes. That will desiccate even a Lone Star ticks and, and American dog ticks, which are uh, less susceptible to desiccation, as I said. So 10 minutes for, for most items will um, disinfect uh, those items from any kind of live ticks. And then obviously using uh, tick repellents, which I had mentioned, um, there, are, there are five that the CDC recommends. And um, the whole idea is they give you about four to six hours of, of uh, protection or repellency. Um, permethrin is a clothing only. We use it on the outfits that we t use outside. Um, it can survive seven washings, so you can apply it when you're not wearing clothing, apply it, let it dry, it binds to the clothing and survives seven washings. Uh, DEED is what most people use um, on their skin as well as a, as a repellent, and the other three are becoming more and more available when it comes to um, the products that are out there. But DEET typically, um, the percentage is around 30%. Any higher percentage of DEET, over 30%, is not more effective. So um, you don't need to buy anything over 30%. So uh, proper tick removal, you know, you don't use uh, cigarettes, you don't use jet fuel, you don't use, uh, you know, nail polish, you don't, you, you, in a way, you do, what they say is you don't want to annoy the tick because it can regurgitate the, the gut contents into the bite site. So you don't want that to happen. So the only thing you do is, is you reach down with a pair of fine tip forceps as close to the skin as possible, possible and pull straight up. So the only thing that is left in the, in this, or anything, the only thing that enters the skin is that hypostome, which is, it's a barbed uh, mouth part and, um, that, that enters. Um, it can't go past the, these are called uh, palps, these, these two items. So it can't go any further than that. So it doesn't really take a whole lot. They secrete a cement that helps them adhere. So when you pull it off and it looks like it has skin, that's actually a cement that they secrete to uh, allow them to adhere uh, to, the, to the bite. So they're not less likely to be bumped off. But um, 
you know, oftentimes the, the skin will swell around the bite, and so it looks like it's buried in, but it's not. So just reach down, pull straight out. And then, um, you know, even if the mouth part remains in, uh, that will be sloughed off. It's not infectious. Uh, you can treat it topically and, uh, and go on your merry way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Well, next up is one of our emergency room physicians, Dr. Max Minerop. Um, Dr. Max Minerop attended medical school at Stony Brook University School of Medicine and completed his residency in emergency medicine at Stony Brook University Hospital, where he was also chief resident. Dr. Minerop is, a board, is board certified in emergency medicine and has worked at Southampton Hospital's emergency department for the past nine years. In addition to seeing patients in the emergency room, he serves as the medical director for the local emergency medical service agencies in East Quag, Hampton Bays, and East Hampton. And he's also Southampton's representative too and chairman of the Suffolk County Regional Emergency Medical Advisory Committee. Dr. Max Minerup. Thank you, thank you. So, the very beginning of this has some slight repetition from what Scott spoke about, but you know, the more we hear things, the more we uh, remember them. No? Okay, let me turn the mic up a tiny bit. Okay. So, as, as Scott said, we have, we have three types of ticks in our area. The, the ones we worry about the most from an infection point of view are the deer tick and the lone star tick. Um, the deer tick carries anaplasma, Poisson, Lyme and Babesia, the Lone Star Tick carries Ehrlichiosis. So you're going through a walk, you know, if you walk down to the beach, you're on a trail, wherever you like, you know, your deer tick or your Lone Star Tick is there questing, as he said, and you're unlucky enough to have him or her grab onto you as opposed to a passing deer. The tick climbs up your body, you know, finds an area that it finds hospitable, typically, you know, areas like behind the knee, the waistband, the armpit on children, often the neck, the head, the ears, and uh, it, it finds a little spot. It, it makes a, a tiny cut in that area, puts some anesthetic down so you don't really feel it, um, buries that barbed hyposome into you, and cements itself into place, you know, for the duration. It wants to uh, you know, get a blood meal so it can move on to the next stage of its life. And during the process of feeding, you know, can transmit one of these uh, tick-borne diseases to you. As he said, somewhere typically between 24 and 72 hours, 36 hours is typically the time you worry about. You know, it's normally after the tick is engorged. So if you're removing a tick that has no blood in it, the risk of it spreading any infection except for the potential of Poisson is extremely low at that point. So, so Lyme disease. You know, Lyme disease is the disease that everyone worries about the most out here. Um, it's the most common. It's also the hardest to initially identify. It has the most indolent initial you know, presentation. Um, it's, as we said, transmitted by the deer tick. So if you're bit by a lone star tick, you don't have to worry about Lyme disease, if you're bit by a dog tick, you don't have to worry about Lyme disease. So the reason you know, we, we miss Lyme so often is the, the, the nymph tick, which is the one that spreads most of the disease, it's not the one that has the most Lyme in it if we go and sample the ticks, but because it's about the size of a poppy seed, it's very easy to miss this tick you know, on your body. Um, you know, once it fills up and it's engorged, it's closer to the size of a sesame seed, but by that time, often, you know, unfortunately, it's transmitted disease. Um, as Dr. Campbell said, the, you know, everyone always blames the deer, the deer, the deer. You know, and I said the deer are, you could look at them more as sort of the, you know, the, the, the mobile home for, for deer ticks. You know, they're not getting infected you know, with any of the pathogens by, you know, by the deer. The deer actually have a very active immune system they don't get sick from Lyme, um, but they bring the ticks to your backyard, you know, and thus increase your exposure. It's the, the white-footed deer mouse that is the reservoir. You know, we use words like, 
vector, reservoir, host, when we speak about tick-borne disease. Reservoirs are where the disease lives in the population. Um, the, uh, the vector is the tick, that's the one who transmits it to us, and the hosts are the deer or us, and it, what we would consider an inadvertent host. You know, deer, a tick would much rather bite a deer than us. I mean, deers don't have fingers. They're not gonna pull the tick off within, you know, hopefully a day of getting bit. Yeah. So, so you get bit by this deer tick and, uh, you know, you pull it off. Unfortunately, it's been about 72 hours. It looks kind of like this guy over here, has some, some blood in it. And, you know, you get, end up getting inoculated with the, the, the spirochete, you know, called uh, Borrelia burgdorferi that transmits Lyme disease. If you're one of the lucky ones who gets, you're unlucky to have been bit, but you're lucky to develop a rash, um, the classic rash of Lyme disease is called erythema migrans. It's a bullseye-shaped rash. It comes in variable presentations, but you know, if, we're, if somewhere between 30 and 50% of people will get the classic rash after having been infected. Um, yeah, you know, if, if you notice this rash, chances are you know, you're, you're gonna recognize it, you're gonna seek treatment, and with any luck, your, your foray with Lyme disease will be over forever. Um, if you're one of the ones who don't get that rash, or you don't notice that rash, this is where Lyme starts to get much more complicated. You know, Lyme disease likes the central nervous system, as Dr. Coy will speak about more. It tends to hide you know, away, makes it very hard to detect. You know, as I said, that initial infection, you know, when you have this rash, you may have no other symptoms, just this rash, and I feel fine, what is this rash? Over the next week or so, you know, you tend to get a low-grade fever, you feel a little bit sick, but often not enough to stop us in our tracks or make us go and seek medical attention. Um, and then that's where things get worse and gets to be more interesting for me as an emergency room doctor, you know. The, um, People start to develop you know, facial nerve palsies where, where half their face doesn't work. Um, they develop big swollen knees where lo the Lyme has invaded that knee and caused an arthritis of that knee or that joint. The, the Lyme can invite, invade the central nervous system, you know, cause meningitis, you know, which is certainly a, you know, an emergency and needs to be treated aggressively. And it can also affect the heart. You know, it involves the nerves or the muscle of the heart and can affect the way we conduct electricity through the heart, putting us into what we call heart blocks, typically, where the heart goes very slow and pumps ineffectively, you know, backing fluid up into your lungs and making you very sick. For the most part, we treat Lyme with doxycycline. You know, it's the, the standard treatment for Lyme disease somewhere between 10 days and 28 days, depending on the severity of your, your illness. Um, if you have one of central nervous system Lyme disease or cardiac Lyme disease, you're gonna end up being on an IV antibiotic called Rocephin or Ceftriaxone, which gives much better penetration into the, the deep parts of our body and helps us to you know, eliminate the, uh, the Lyme. Now, as you get into the final stages of Lyme, if things get harder also, what we call chronic Lyme, which many people suffer with. Some of them had Lyme disease, some of them probably never had Lyme disease, and they blame everything on the Lyme. But it has more to do with the damage that the bacteria did, not an active infection at that point. And you know, it's best, of course, to prevent. Prevent yourself from being bitten by a tick, catch the infection early, and treat early so that you never end up in that position. Okay. So, much, you know, Babesia is, is a much more aggressive infection. People typically aren't going to wonder if they have Babesia. You know, many people wonder, do they have Lyme disease? Is this Lyme? Babesia, you've been hit by a truck. You know, you have, it's, it's July, we see most cases in July and August. You know, you're, you have a high fever, severe body aches, an awful headache. You know, you, you really haven't felt this sick in a long, long time. Um, it's a, as I said, a protozoan, not a bacteria. It invades your red blood cell. So just like malaria, you're bit by this tick. It feeds on you for, you know, again, that, that, you know, 48 hours or so. Babesia gets into your system, and it starts to, to replicate. So within, you know, a week to two weeks, you start to get fevers, body aches, a flu-like illness, people call it, but not the classic flu where you have a cough and a sore throat. But, you know, just really no symptoms except these fevers and body aches. Um, 
we will, you know, you, you come to the hospital, your blood is drawn, we'll notice that you have anemia, you know, meaning a low red blood cell count or a low blood count. This is because the Babesia has invaded the red blood cell and it replicates in the red blood cell and then eventually there's too many of them in there and it makes the cell burst. That bursting releases all kinds of inflammatory mediators into the body, which is what makes you feel sick and gives you this relapsing fever. You know, you're getting a little better, then all of a sudden, boom, you feel very sick again. Um, you know, when we look at your blood, if you, know, if you have a significant amount of obesity in it, we'll actually be able to identify it you know, on that visit you know, inside the red blood cell. Will we be able to tell that you have malaria or Babesia? No, but we will assume that if you haven't been traveling to Africa or Central America, some other malaria endemic area, that this is Babesiosis, you know, and the nickname for it is Montauk malaria, um, you know, that you will uh, get treated appropriately. So the thing about Babesia that's different than all the other tick illnesses is that it's not treated with doxycycline. Now, we give a, an antibiotic called Mepron as well as an antibiotic called Azithromycin. Both can be given orally, and if you are well enough, you know, don't have a very high load of this parasite on your smear of blood, if you are not extremely dehydrated, needing other supportive care, you'll be able to go home on two oral antibiotics and do well and beat this illness. However, if you have more than about a 10% load, you know, meaning when we look at your blood smear, 10% of the cells seem to have the parasite in them, You'll need to be hospitalized, um, sometimes even transferred to a tertiary center, and uh, you know, go through what we call an exchange transfusion, where they actually take a bit of your, take a, a portion of your blood out to clear the infection and replace it with uh, transfused blood. Thus, you don't have as strong of a reaction. Okay. Um, yeah, Poisson virus, as you said, is, it's a very rare disease. It's getting a lot of attention because like most viral encephalitises, which you know, most of them we see from mosquito you know, transmission, um, it can be transmitted very quickly. I mean, imagine how long a mosquito is on you to transmit a disease in comparison to how long a tick is on you. Um, like, mo all, like all viral infections for the most part, there is no specific treatment for Poisson. Um, it's supportive care, Tylenol, Motrin, IV fluids. Make sure you don't have a bacterial meningitis and treat you for a bacterial meningitis until we know you don't. But other than that, it's, your body will have to beat it. So fortunately, we really don't have any cases of reported Poisson in Suffolk. So this is more, there's more fear out there about Poisson than there you know, deserves to be. So, Ehrlichia, which is, is transmitted by the, the Lone Star Tick, is, is very similar to Anaplasma, which I'm, I, I'm, I would akin the two to each other. Um, one, in, they infect two different kinds of white blood cells, but basically this bacteria, you know, you're bitten by the tick, the bacteria is transmitted to you, it invades your white blood cell, which is, you know, what is, is the cell in the body that's designed to fight your infection. So the white blood cell thinks it's doing its job. It goes, it, uh, you know, eats the bacteria, you know, high fives all around, everybody's, uh, you know, happy, the bacteria's gone, and the bacteria starts multiplying inside the white blood cell, eventually bursting it, and then re-releasing into the bloodstream. You know, you can get very, very sick very quickly from ehrlichiosis. Um, you know, we don't have any testing to tell us you definitely have ehrlichia, you know, immediately available to us in the emergency department, but we tend to see patterns in your blood work we see that you have a very low white blood cell count instead of a high white blood cell count, which typically people fighting an infection do. We see that your platelet counts go down very low, and we often see that your sodium in your blood drops, as well as um, we see uh, a change in your liver function test. So anytime we see those patterns, you have a fever that we can't explain some other way, we're gonna presumptively treat you with doxycycline at that point. It's far better to treat then wait for someone to decline while we're waiting several days for a confirmatory blood test to come back. Okay. So the other thing about uh, the Lone Star Tick is that it can cause you know, a reaction called alpha-gal, which Dr. McGinty will get much more into. Um, essentially, though, very, very superficially, it can be transmitted by any stage of the tick because it's not an infection, and it will make you then you know, allergic to uh, most mammalian meats. So 
So why, why come to the emergency department for a tick bite? You know, when to do it and what, what should you expect? I mean, it can be as simple as you have a tick stuck on you somewhere you can't get to and you don't have anyone else that you trust to take it off. You know, people come in for this all the time. Many people at that point, you know, there's sort of a, uh, a practice of prophylactically treating for Lyme disease when you're bit by a tick. It's, you know, it's, it's not completely recommended. Do I do it sometimes? Absolutely, if that's what the patient wants. I think there's very little harm to taking one dose of doxycycline when you remove a tick. But the number needed to treat, meaning how many people do you have to do this for to make a difference, is about 50. You know, so it's an over, overused practice in general. And most of the ticks are not engorged with blood. You know, they say that tick should have been on you for about 72 hours before you really need that dose of of doxycycline, or, or would benefit in any way from that dose of doxycycline. The more acute reason to come to the ER is, you know, I have a high fever in the summertime, and my body aches, and I don't know what's wrong. You know, in the emergency department, you're going to get to an answer much more quickly than you would in an urgent care or your primary care's office, and get on appropriate treatment, and receive the supportive care you need to beat Ehrlichia and Aplasma. I mean, these are diseases with real mortality rates. You know, people die from Ehrlichia, they die from anaplasma, they die from Babesia. Lyme, unless it really gets into your, you know, your heart's conduction system and you die from that, Lyme makes you old. It doesn't kill you typically. You know? um, so I would urge people if they have a fever to come in and be seen, you know, in the middle of the summer to come in and be seen. Okay. Any other questions? Or at the end, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Minerop. Our next presenter is Dr. Patricia Coyle. Um, Patricia Coyle is Vice Chair and Professor of Neurology at Stony Brook University Medical Center, as well as the Director of the Stony Brook Multiple Sclerosis Comprehensive Care Center. Dr. Coyle received her MD degree from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she completed a fellowship in neuroimmunology and neurovirology. She established a successful research laboratory in addition to building a busy clinical practice at the Stony Brook University Medical Center. Her areas of expertise include multiple sclerosis, neuroimmunology, and neurological infectious disease, in particular Lyme disease. She's currently involved in a number of therapeutic trials testing new immuno immunotherapies for MS, as well as studies addressing the neurological aspects of Lyme disease. Dr. Coyle is in demand both nationally and internationally as a lecturer on MS and neurological infections. Dr. Coyle. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk about neurologic Lyme disease, which is a, a very hot topic. We recognize Lyme disease as the major tick-borne infection. We've heard about several, but Lyme disease is the major one. And it's important to emphasize this is a bacterial infection, which means it's eminently treatable with appropriate antibiotics. That should take care of the Lyme infection. It's not untreatable, it's very treatable. The earlier you get appropriate treatment, the better. You can get reinfected, by the way, but it's an eminently treatable infection. You want to get the appropriate antibiotics. Now, not everybody that gets inoculated with a bacterial spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, gets sick. So you may have somebody who's inoculated and they're able to contain the infection or they didn't get pathologic strains, they may be Lyme antibody positive, but they don't necessarily have an active infection. We don't really know the percent of people that have asymptomatic infections with B. burgdorferi. We do know it targets specific body organs, the skin in particular, that erythema migrans, or EM. That's what most people have, and you don't need any laboratory data don't need any blood work. If a doctor says you have an EM, you've been diagnosed with local Lyme disease. And then it targets the joints, as we've heard about the heart, and then the nervous system, both central and peripheral nervous system. Now, the nervous system can be involved very early on, very quickly. We think it depends on the strain of the spirochete that you get inoculated with by the tick that there are neurotropic strains that can spread very quickly to the nervous system. 
or you may see neurologic disease late. A sister spirochetal human infection is syphilis. And one of the features of spirochetal infection are stages. So once the spirochetes seed to a body organ, they may remain quiescent there for quite some time and then pop up with late disease. Only a minority do, but that's why it's so important to treat early and take care of the infection. You don't want to risk, if the infection goes untreated, of having a late neurologic infection. An important fact, most neurologic Lyme disease cases occur from May to October. Now, they can occur year-round, but highly unusual outside of that window. And there are characteristic neurologic syndromes of Lyme disease, and that's a key factor. So first of all, this peripheral facial nerve palsy, or cranial nerve 7, where one side of the face gets paralyzed. You can't close your eyelid very well. You may not be able to close it at all. You can't wrinkle your forehead and one side of the face is drooping, almost like you have a stroke, but a stroke doesn't involve the forehead. One key feature that would confirm that unilateral facial weakness is likely a facial nerve palsy is, is there any tearing abnormality, increased or decreased? You don't see that with a central issue. Is there a hearing, hyperacusis, abnormal hearing on the side of the weak face? And is there loss of taste? on that side of the tongue. Tearing, hearing, taste abnormalities associated with a unilateral facial weakness would be very, would, would really say this is a peripheral cranial nerve, cranial nerve seven, facial nerve palsy. Now we also call it Bell's palsy, but actually it's not. By definition, Bell's palsy, which is a cranial nerve seven, a peripheral facial nerve palsy, is, is an idiopathic facial nerve palsy. You couldn't find the cause. If you know it's Lyme disease producing the facial nerve palsy, it's actually not Bell's then. It's a Lyme-related facial nerve palsy. Most idiopathic Bell's palsies are due to herpes simplex or varicella zoster. They're due to herpes viral infections, and that's the basis of giving an antiviral agent. But of course, if Lyme disease is doing it, that's not a virus, that's a bacterial infection. One big hint is the facial paralysis accompanied by a multi-symptom complex. Like in addition to the face getting weak, looking like it's an acute stroke, but your arm and leg are fine, that's not an issue. Does the person have joint pains, muscle pains, headache? stiff neck, fatigue, that multi-symptom complex along with the facial nerve palsy would be highly suggestive for neurologic Lyme disease. And it's said that up to 25% of facial nerve palsies on Long Island in summertime are due to neurologic Lyme disease. Another characteristic syndrome called acute painful radiculoneuritis. No headache, no stiff neck, but spine pain terrible spine pain coming out of the blue. And then you may have problems with numbness or weakness of hands or arms, but it's in a strip, almost going back to a spinal nerve root type issue. No headache, no stiff neck, but bad spine pain, maybe in between the shoulder blades, and then you're having some sensory and motor abnormalities. That's a very characteristic syndrome of early disseminated neurologic Lyme disease. And then the meningitis. What does meningitis do? Meningitis is inflammation of the lining membranes of the brain. So you get a bad headache, but it's accompanied by a stiff neck. How would you check for that? Put your chin to your chest. You're stretching the meninges, which are inflamed. So that hurts. So that's the sign of a meningitis. But Lyme meningitis doesn't act like a regular bacteria. Bacterial meningitis is life-threatening, and people get sicker and sicker, and they'll die often if you don't get appropriate antibiotics. For a viral, or so-called aseptic meningitis, that's not true. It's a paler picture of a meningitis. Yes, you get bad headache and stiff neck, but you're not looking at the patient and saying, oh, they look horrible, we've got to admit them to the hospital. They don't look that bad, 
and they'll spontaneously get better after a couple of weeks. And there are a lot of viruses that can cause meningitis, and there's no specific treatment, and ultimately they do well. Well, Lyme meningitis mimics the viral picture, not the bacterial picture. So if somebody has bad headache and stiff neck, doesn't look too sick, but bad headache and stiff neck out of the blue in the summertime, that could be Lyme meningitis. They need to be evaluated. They need to be worked up for that. Then you have a neurologic syndrome, the most common that we see later on due to Lyme disease. And it's a little bit vague and elusive. It's called late Lyme encephalopathy. This isn't talking about people that suddenly get demented. This isn't talking about people that suddenly have a huge lapse in their memory and cognitive abilities. It's much milder, much more subtle. They're typically still able to operate, still able to go to work, et cetera, but they know they're just not thinking right. They know they're just not as sharp. They know their mind, their brain is just not working properly. So it's a subtle issue. That can represent late neurologic Lyme disease, anywhere from three months or longer after the initial inoculation with Borrelia burgdorferi. And then an age-related neurologic syndrome in children and adolescents, teenagers, uh, the intracranial hypertension syndrome. A child or adolescent who presents out of the blue with headache during summertime in a Lyme endemic area, you would never ignore that, but they need to be neurologically evaluated. If their headache is associated with papilledema, when somebody looks in the back of the eye with a fundus exam, they may have a neurologic Lyme disease syndrome and that needs to be recognized and worked up. So you want to make sure that a child or adolescent with new headache gets an evaluation, including looking at the back of the eye to make sure it doesn't look like they have what we call a choke disc or papilledema. You will only see that if you look in the back of the eye with a fundus examination. All right, so what's the workup? What's the diagnostic workup for suspected neurologic Lyme disease? Well, the first thing you want to say is most should absolutely be Lyme antibody positive. In their blood, they should have evidence that they've mounted an immune response against the invading bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi. And our typical antibody test is a two-tier system. We do a screening test, typically what's called an ELISA, but then it must be confirmed by a second test called a Western blot or an immunoblot, which is more time consuming, more expensive, and requires a qualitative read. That's currently the state of the art. The screening ELISA has a built-in 20 to 25% false positive rate for a bunch of reasons but it'll typically be a low false positive. And then you go to the Western blot and it's not, and it's not confirmed. There is a recombinant protein-based test called Lyme C6 peptide, okay? But I think this is going to be revolutionized in the next few years. And we're gonna drop the Western blot, I think, and we're gonna drop the typical ELISA that does uh, a sonicate of the whole gamish. And what we're going to be going to, I think, in the next few years are maybe two recombinant-based tests, or maybe one big one, based on multiple very purified antigens. We're going to get better about that. I think that's going to change. Can you be antibody negative and have neurologic Lyme disease or have Lyme disease? It's possible. We believe it's very unusual. What would stop somebody from making antibodies? Early abortive antibiotics. After you get inoculated with the spirochete by the tick, it does take a couple of weeks for your immune system to make antibodies. It starts coming up at about two weeks, three weeks. The IgM Western blot is the first one positive. If you took any form of antibiotics, like somebody thought you had a strep throat, 
and they gave you antibiotics for that. Early on, you can abort the antibody response, and you might create an antibody negative, what we call zero negative case. So the vast majority of Lyme disease cases, neurologic Lyme disease, are going to be antibody positive. They're going to be zero positive. But occasionally it can happen if they got early abortive antibiotics that I can interfere with that. And then another test that I might often do if I suspected Lyme disease is I might check for antibodies to Babesia and that human granulocytic anaplasmosis because it's going to bolster the right tick exposure. So I might do that in the blood. But the major test you want to do if you suspect neurologic Lyme disease is a lumbar puncture and take off cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, which is the blood of the brain and the spinal cord. And we are underdoing this test. In my opinion, this is a required diagnostic test for anybody where you are raising the possibility they could have neurologic Lyme disease. It would be typical to look at their spinal fluid and evaluate it for Lyme antibodies, and in particular, intrathecal Lyme antibodies. What does that mean? Higher antibody titer against the Lyme agent in the spinal fluid than in the blood, because you can get little leakage in. I'd also be looking for increased cell count. The normal cell count in spinal fluid is zero to five white cells per millimeter cubed. I might see 20, 30, 100, 200 if somebody had a meningitis or an inflammatory infection. And I'd also expect the total protein in the spinal fluid to be up. Plus, you can rule out other conditions. Just think of the spinal fluid as the blood of the brain and the spinal cord. So if you suspect a neurologic infection, you almost always want to look at spinal fluid. Imaging of the brain is typically not helpful because the vast majority of neurologic Lyme patients will have, will have normal brain MRIs. Now, I might do it. I might want to do it. But I don't typically expect it to be abnormal. Only about 20% will have lesions there. And some of them may disappear after appropriate antibiotic treatment. There's a nuclear medicine test called the brain SPECT that's sometimes done. There is no typical brain SPECT for neurologic Lyme disease. If somebody says that, they really don't know what they're talking about, OK? And then other tests, you may want to do cognitive function testing. If I suspect somebody with late Lyme encephalopathy, I would probably want to do that before they got antibiotic treatment and then months after to show improvement. And electrophysiologic testing, meaning nerve conduction tests, EMG, if I suspected peripheral nervous system involvement with Lyme disease. How do you treat it? Antibiotics. You want to give appropriate, this is a bacterial infection, nothing magic. The right antibiotics should get rid of the Lyme agent. But if you have nervous system involvement, the CNS, which is relatively sequestered, the oral antibiotics that we typically use don't penetrate very well. There have been clear cases of neurologic infection after doxycycline courses. Doxycycline does not penetrate that well. So if I feel the patient has neurologic Lyme disease involving their central nervous system, a relatively sequestered key body organ, I'm going to give intravenous antibiotics, ceftriaxone, two grams once a day, run in over 30 minutes, and I'm personally going to use it for 28 days, for four weeks. Now, all the guidelines talk about treating for two weeks to four weeks. And if we're being very honest, evidence-based, there's a New England Journal article from some years ago that looked at neurologic Lyme disease, giving IV ceftriaxone two weeks and four weeks, and the results were the same, exactly the same. So you would say, well, why are you giving four weeks if the article said two weeks was as good? And this is a personal thing. Early on at Stony Brook, we had several patients with neurologic Lyme disease that lapsed after three weeks of IV ceftriaxone. They relapsed. We had to retreat them. When we went to four weeks, we didn't see anybody relapsing anymore. So we've kind of kept to that. I'm telling you very honestly, even though there's that New England Journal. 
and I'm hoping we get a better active infection assay to guide me better. But I'd rather maybe over-treat early and take care of the problem than have the patient coming back later. That's the attitude that we've taken. There's also in the literature an article saying doxycycline works for neurologic Lyme disease. That's from Europe, not from the US, not from North America. And there are differences between the Lyme spirochetes in Europe versus the US. And there have clearly been neurologic uh, cases after doxycycline, so we do not like to use that. We will typically talk about putting in a line that can be used for 28 days. We put patients on daily acidophilus because pseudomembranous colitis can rarely occur. We alert them with the line if it got red or it hurt, that's abnormal, it could get clotted or infected, doesn't happen very often at all. But these are the things we tell people about. And then I've never seen a case of this, but ceftriaxone is excreted in biliary sludge. And years ago, there were some examples of gallbladder disease, right upper quadrant. So those are the three things that we counsel patients about. But it's very rare to have complications. So to summarize, I think it's important that everybody here recognize the symptoms of neurologic Lyme disease in summer, because you're all at risk. We're all at risk living in a Lyme endemic area. If you have a clearly neurologic issue, best to see a neurologist, OK, because there's a differential diagnosis. It may be neurologic Lyme disease. It may be something else. Absolutely have an appropriate workup, and that for all intents and purposes, must include evaluation of spinal fluid, in my opinion, and then get treated, and intravenous antibiotics for documented or highly suspected neurologic disease, I think, are really the best way to go based on the best penetration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coyle. Dr. Erin McGinty is, uh, we refer to her as our alpha gal, um, and she'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, Dr. Erin McGinty uh, obtained her medical degree from SUNY Stony Brook and her training in pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Following her residency, Dr. McGinty pursued subspecialty training during a three-year fellowship in allergy and immunology with adult cross-training at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She's board certified in allergy and immunology, and in 2009, she returned to New York and joined ENT and Allergy Associates, where she practices both adult and pediatric allergy and clinical immunology. With a special interest in meat allergy, alpha-gal, which is caused by the Lone Star Tick, Dr. McGinty has presented nationally on the subject and has been interviewed about alpha-gal by a number of media outlets, including the Associated Press, Sirius XM Satellite Radio, and the BBC. Dr. McGinty sees patients at her office in Southampton. Dr. McGinty. Uh, good morning. Morning, still. Um, yeah, I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit from all this talk about tick-borne diseases, and I'm going to talk about a food allergy that is um, caused by tick bites. And normally I talk about this allergy in a talk that takes about an hour, so it was a little bit of a challenge to kind of pare this talk down, so bear with me. Um, so just to start, what is alpha-gal? So alpha-gal is a nickname for um, galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, uh, which is a blood group carbohydrate that is expressed in all non-primate mammals. Um, and it's expressed widely throughout all the cells. So non-primate mammals, I'm basically talking about cows, pigs, deer, uh, guinea pigs, cats, dogs. Pets can't uh, become allergic to alpha-gal because they are non-primate mammals. It's part of their genetic makeup. Um, humans, apes, um, monkeys, we don't express alpha-gal due to an um, inactive gene product. And that's why we can become allergic to it. Um, so there's a really long and interesting story about how alpha-gal allergy was first developed. And it actually, uh, the, the tick link was not made until later. Um, it was actually uh, first discovered um, in the context of a chemotherapy drug 
um, which, which was a monoclonal antibody that was developed in a, a mouse cell line. And the drug actually had alpha-gal in the finished product. And they were seeing patients in certain portions of the country who were having anaphylactic reactions with their first exposure to the drug, um, suggesting that they had some preformed antibody present uh, that was setting them up for that reaction. Um, within that study, there was a small subset of the patients who had reacted to the cetuximab, which was the drug, who were also reporting that they felt like they were allergic to meat. And so that intrigued um, some of my colleagues down at University of Virginia. And in uh, 2009 was when the first uh, paper on alpha-gal, the meat allergy, was published. And this was published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And um, my colleagues down at UVA reported on uh, 24 patients in the southeast, which is where this drug was first discovered. Um, and these patients in their, in their study uh, were demonstrating onset of allergic reactions that were occurring three to six hours after ingestion of meat from a mammal. Um, they often did not have positive skin testing, which is sort of the gold standard for diagnosing most food allergies, unless it was injected under the skin. Um, and this was just a breakdown of their uh, patients. <clears throat> and the important points I just want to point out are <clears throat> they were able to demonstrate in these 24 patients that all of them had measurable antibody to alpha-gal. Um, ranging wi widely from as low as 0.52. Uh, negative is considered anything less than 0.35, um, all the way up to greater than 100. And yet all of them were clinically reactive. Um, and they all reported a delay in the onset of their symptoms. This is hours. So ranging anywhere from you know three to uh, six hours after they ate the meat, which is um, very atypical. For, for a food allergy. So what kind of reactions do we see? Um, there, there, Alpha-gal does not cause chronic symptoms. Alpha-gal does not cause a chronic skin rash. Alpha-gal does not cause chronic abdominal pain. If you're allergic to alpha-gal, your allergic reactions are going to look very similar to an allergic reaction that someone might have to a bee sting or that someone might have to a peanut. These are acute allergic reactions, just like every other allergic reaction I treat. Um, the difference is this delay. Okay, most allergic reactions happen immediately. Alpha-gal reactions typically occur as three to eight hours later. And uh, for that reason, I, I, I do a longer talk, and I, I call it midnight anaphylaxis because the vast majority of cases will uh, present in the middle of the night. So in my office, anyone who comes in, the, in, in complaining of waking up in the middle of the night having an allergic reaction, my next question is, what did you eat for dinner that night? Um, what kind of symptoms do we see? Um, hives, itching, that's by far the most common symptom. So you know, 80 to 90% of people who have an alpha-gal reaction are going to present with uh, itching and hives. Um, often pe people will complain of abdominal pain, and these uh, symptoms can be severe um, and, and quite common in alpha-gal allergy. Up to 50 to 60% of patients will present with abdominal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe cramping. Um, People can become lightheaded and uh, occasionally pass out, and that's uh, due to a drop in blood pressure. And I do see this occasionally in patients with alpha-gal allergy. And then less commonly, we will see people who have difficulty breathing, chest tightness, and full-blown multi-organ system involvement, which, which we refer to in the allergy world as anaphylaxis. That does occur with this allergy. Um, it's not the typical presentation, but we do see it. So it's not like everyone who has alpha-gal allergy is going to go into anaphylactic shock when they eat a bite of a burger, but we do see it. Oops. So, so why do we think there is this delay? Uh, it, it appears to have something to do with the, the fat in the meat, okay? So alpha-gal itself is a carbohydrate, but there's something to do with the fat, because we do know that the fattier the meat, the more likely someone is to have an allergic reaction, and the more severe that reaction is likely to be. Um, 
without getting into it, um, fat, when, when we eat something with fat, it takes about three to four hours for the fat to be absorbed into our bloodstream. And that's kind of when we see the reactions of alpha-gal. Um, so that's why we believe there is this unusual delay of hours before the allergic reaction occurs. Patients do not feel symptoms when they eat meat. It's not like a peanut allergy where they put the peanut in their mouth and their mouth starts to get itchy. If you put meat in your mouth and your mouth starts to get itchy right away, that I don't know what that is, but the, the, my first thought is this is not alpha-gal allergy because that's just not the way this allergy works. Um, and here's actually one example of, a, of an actual meat challenge, and hopefully it's projecting well, but this is a patient who has positive alpha-gal IgE testing. Um, this was her before the meat challenge. Um, and for meat challenges, we'll typically feed a patient two sausage patties from McDonald's. That's just sort of by convention. Patients need to be observed for at least eight hours when we do a meat challenge, so not too many people are enthused about eating a burger at you know, 7.30 or 8 in the morning. So we went with a, a high-fat breakfast meat. So we do sausage patties, and here she is. And this is almost four hours after eating the meat. And I don't know if you can see her. Her palms are very red. She's getting blotchy here on her arms. Um, and I have a bunch of other slides of, of challenge reactions, but in the interest of uh, time, I left those out. So a food allergy caused by a tick bite is a very novel concept. And this, the, the link to the ticks actually came several years um, after the allergy was identified. But there were, there were some suspicions that, that this could have been an issue dating back as early as 1989 when, when a, a woman by the name of Sandra Latimer, she's a layperson living in uh, Georgia, rural Georgia, and, and she went to her local allergist and said, I, I know about 11 people who have gotten tick bites, and now they're allergic to meat. So it never actually went anywhere there, but there is a letter written to the Georgia State Allergy Society by this woman and her local allergist reporting this suspicion dating back into the late 80s. Um, so knowing about that, um, my colleagues down south um, started thinking that, that maybe that is the reason why we're seeing um, so, so many more issues with alpha-gal allergy, initially in the southeast, which is where they thought it was the only place that it affected. So this is a, um, a map uh, back from 2011, and this was from uh, the paper I, I mentioned earlier, showing um, the states with the large stars are the states with the largest number of um, alpha-gal cases reported. And you can see, sort of striking if you see this is a map just looking at the geographical incidence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. You can see the states that are most affected are sort of in the same area. So tick endemic areas, it seems that places that are heavily populated with ticks and tick-borne diseases also saw more cases of alpha-gal allergy. And, and uh, this is, a, a, you know, this is a, a dated map as well. I haven't seen an updated one, but this is the geographical distribution of the Lone Star Tick according to the CDC website um, from 2012. So you can see some parallels. And what, what the guys did once they suspected this tick theory, they looked at it in a couple of different ways. Um, this is a graph showing um, alpha-gal antibody on this y-axis and total allergy antibody on this axis. And the people in the red triangles are the people who specifically reported having experienced tick or chigger bites. And as you can see, the people with the red triangles tended to have the higher titers of alpha-gal antibodies. So clearly just an association, but worth noting, this is a table looking at um, IgE to alpha-gal allergen on the bottom axis and IgE to other lone star tick proteins. And you can see the patients who are higher in alpha-gal antibody also were higher in antibodies against other tick proteins. So again, another correlation, not uh, clear proof. Uh, the most compelling story was when they actually took three patients from the control group who during the course of the study reported that they had sustained multiple lone star tick bites. And in each of these three patients, um, 
the bottom line is the most important line. That's actually IgE antibody to alpha-gal, allergy antibody against alpha-gal. They were all negative, and then the red arrows are when they actually um, sustained Lone Star tick bites. And you can see in each of the patients after Lone Star tick bites, their alpha-gal antibody went from negative to positive. Uh, this one went only slightly. The other two went more significantly. And then it would trend down, and then if they got another Lone Star tick bite, it would start to trend up again. And the red stars are actually incidents of allergic reactions to meat in patients who were originally in the control group who had never had a problem with meat before. Those are my most science-y slides. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit more practically. Um, so my own personal experience with alpha-gal, I diagnosed my first case in um, end of 2011. And, uh, at this point, I've, I'm pushing uh, 400. At this time of the year, it's hard to give a definite number because I'm seeing new cases every day. Um, when I spoke to the guys down doing the research on this allergy, um, my cases were the first um, identified on Long Island. Um, so how do, we, how do I make the diagnosis? When do I suspect alpha-gal allergy? So first of all, um, Patients are almost invariably going to give a history of having had Lone Star tick bites. And, and realistically, it's usually going to be relatively temporarily close to when they had their first reaction. It's unusual for someone to present in February. And I understand, Dr. Campbell, so people can get tick bites at any time of year. But you also saw when he said Lone Star ticks were active. It would be very unusual for someone to present with their first alpha-gal reaction in the middle of the winter. People are much more likely to have their first reaction in the weeks to a month following a Lone Star tick bite. So not only do I usually get a history of Lone Star tick bites, I can usually get a, a relatively recent history of a patient having had a bite within the month preceding the reaction. Um, just because a patient tells me that um, they can sometimes eat meat does not rule out this allergy. Again, it, it, it's very different than other food allergies. There are some patients who are exquisitely sensitive and can't even eat a piece of chicken that was cooked on a grill that cooked meat. That is definitely the exception rather than the rule. It happens, but that's not the typical story. More typically is someone who had a reaction after they ate a burger at you know, a restaurant, but then didn't realize what it was, and a few days later ate a roast beef sandwich from the deli, and they were fine. Again, it all comes back to the, to the fat content. So just because someone's sometimes eating meat does not mean that, that they, they couldn't have this allergy. Um, you may hear, um, you, you know, there's a, there's a alpha-gal patient blog that you can find on Facebook. You know, if you do internet searches, you're going to find all sorts of things. And many of my patients ask me, am I allowed to consume dairy? Or, or they self-diagnosed and they haven't been eating dairy for years. Um, again, patients, minority of patients can have problems with dairy. Um, it's typically higher fat dairy like ice cream. But the vast majority of patients, even patients who have had anaphylaxis to a burger, typically are able to tolerate dairy. So I do not routinely counsel people that they must avoid it. I do caution them, particularly about higher fat dairies, dairy. Um, gelatin, on the other hand, which is derived from beef and pork, um, I have seen as more of an issue. So again, it doesn't mean that if you have alpha-gal allergy, you absolutely can't eat it. But I've definitely seen patients react to gelatin. Um, this is a, a super practical point, <clears throat> and I, I, I like to um, mention this just to make people aware. When I say unpublished data, I'm talking about my data, but I have a lot of patients, so I think it's, I, I can make this fair comment here. Um, patients can have a positive alpha-gal IgE test and not be allergic to alpha-gal, not be clinically reactive to meat. Okay, the same way that a patient can have a positive peanut allergy test and not be allergic to peanut. You know, I see so many patients who come in, their pediatrician sent a peanut test and they come to me with a positive test and they say, well, what are your symptoms with peanut? And they, they say, I oh, know my kid eats peanut butter and jelly for lunch every day, but they have a positive test. A positive test doesn't make a food allergy diagnosis. It's only one piece of the puzzle. And the same goes for alpha-gal allergy. So for this reason, and I know this is going to sound scary, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it, 
I, I would discourage you from running to your doctor asking for an alpha-gal test just because you got a Lone Star Tick Bite. The ma majority of people who get Lone Star Tick Bites do not become allergic to alpha-gal. And it, in the weeks following a Lone Star Tick Bite is when you're at your highest likelihood of having a low positive test that may not be clinically relevant. Um, and I'll, how much more do I have? All right. And I'll just tell you really quickly, because it, it would probably come up in the questions and answers anyway. So then what do you do? You had a Lone Star tick bite. You're terrified. You, you're afraid to eat meat. And, and you know everybody's different. But there's no right answer here. But I can tell you what I do personally, because I grew up in East Hampton. And I live there now. And I live in the woods. And, and we get tick bites in our house. It's, 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 we're careful. We, we do our spraying. And we, and we put our permethrin on our clothing. But we get tick bites. Um, I just back off on the meat for a little while. I won't say I strictly avoid it, but I don't go out for a burger a week after I got a Lone Star Tick Bite. People are most likely to react in the couple of weeks following a bite. And then, as you saw from that slide, the antibody levels come down. So if you're nervous about alpha-gal allergy, become a, not a vegetarian. You can eat your chicken and your turkey and your fish. Don't eat mammal meat for a couple of weeks. And then add it back gradually. Start with lean meat. It, highly unlikely, and I know there are some exceptions, highly unlikely that you're going to go into anaphylactic shock from a small piece of lean meat, even if you do have alpha-gal allergy. And that, that's how I approach it. That's how I approach it with my kids. That's how I encourage my patients to approach it. Um, if someone's really terrified, I still would not recommend testing right away. If you're very scared to eat meat, I would say then avoid it for a couple of months, assume you maybe have it, and then do the test when you're less likely to get a false positive. Um, but we can talk more about that if you have further questions. Um, if you're going to ask your primary to send the test, which I would discourage unless they have a really good understanding of an appropriate reason to send it, they need to send it along with a total allergy antibody level. Because it's not just the level that matters, it's the ratio between the two. Um, so in summary, alpha-gal allergy causes delayed allergic reactions to meat from mammals. We know it's induced by bites from the Lone Star Tick. Um, we know it goes away over time okay, if you can avoid further Lone Star Ticks. But if you get further Lone Star Ticks, the allergy can worsen. Um, and then again, uh, just to reinforce, not everyone who gets bitten by the Lone Star Tick will develop this allergy, and false positive tests are not uncommon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGinty. Is anybody else's skin crawling at this point every time I watch one of these? Um, our next presenter, and we just have two more, and then we'll have some questions and answers. And thank you all for your, your attentiveness. Is, is uh, uh, Anne Marie Wellens. Anne Marie Wellens, Dr. Anne Marie Wellens, is a, um, earned her BSN degree from the College of Mount St. Vincent, followed by her graduate degree in nursing education from Teachers College at Columbia University and her Doctor of Nurse Practice at Stony Brook University. She also completed an MS degree in Adult Health at Stony Brook University. Dr. Wellens has worked in primary care since 2012 as part of Southampton Hospital's Meeting House Lane Medical Practice. And in 2015, she joined the faculty at Stony Brook University in the Advanced Graduate Nursing Education Program, where she continues to teach. She's currently a member of the Medical Advisory Panel of the Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center and she's the panel's co-investigator in a Rutgers University NIH-funded study on Lyme disease, which has as its goal to develop an accurate blood test to diagnose early Lyme disease. Dr. Wellens. So I'm going to talk about a Lyme disease study. What was alluded to earlier um, by Dr. Coyle is how difficult it is to diagno diagnose early Lyme disease. So the current study that I'm involved with is um, I'm actually the principal investigator, um, and it's basically recruiting patients that present with a rash, um, a typical bullseye rash, or even an atypical rash 
um, related to possible uh, tick-borne disease. The aim of the study um, that we're trying to do is we're looking at um, collecting blood and tissue samples so that they can be analyzed to look at the immunological and inflammatory processes of Lyme disease, very complex. The uh, spirochete, the Borrelia burgdorferi, um, are a little bit different. There's different genetic um, uh, genomic makeups of these organisms. They have uh, proteins in their cell wall, um, and some of those proteins are more pathogenic. So that we're looking, we're trying to find the more pathogenic strains of the organism. So this is part of what we're doing with this study. Uh, we're also looking at, again, you know, um, the dissemination of disease. Uh, it starts in the skin. Uh, some organisms, some strains of this spirochete stay just in the skin, uh, or they'll disseminate. So we're, we're trying to look at why that that's happening as well. Um, and then the testing is really to look at, because it really isn't, if you have like a strep or a staph infection, you can easily do a culture um, and find it. With um, Lyme disease, this spirochete infection is, doesn't stay in the blood very long, so it's very difficult to test it, to culture it. Um, and then the goal, again, is to look at um, really developing an early, accurate um, test for Lyme disease. So the background is um, we test that can help diagnose a disease, such as Lyme disease, is definitely needed. A good test, if we have a good test, particularly for patients that don't present typically. If we have a patient that comes in, if I have a patient that comes into practice and they have a, a bullseye rash, I'm like slam dunk, that's great, you're going on antibiotics, please take the whole course of antibiotics and then you should be fine. Um, I mean, there are exceptions, but if patients are treated early, with the appropriate antibiotics for the full course of treatment, then there should be no um, sequelae or any chronic or complications later on. But that doesn't always happen because what we're seeing is we're seeing more patients without a rash uh, presenting with um, elusive and sometimes vague um, symptoms. We're not always sure what, what it is. When we do the regular two-tier um, ELISA Western blot that Dr. Coyle talked about, if it's early Lyme, it's not going to, you're not mounting an antibody response in the beginning. It's going to take a month for that for those antibodies to mount. And we're not going to wait a month. We want to treat you. And if you're treated with antibiotics early, you shouldn't mount any antibodies at all. Uh, but what do we do in the beginning? How do we know? Um, we really don't know. Um, there is um, one test, which I'll talk about, which is a PCR. But that is also a problem because uh, you have to catch it at a very specific time um, in order for the test to be positive. Okay. So we're in the danger months. You can see um, this was um, alluded to earlier. We're like right now, um, the nymphs, which are the smaller of the, um, the ticks that are not easily recognized, uh, we're exposed to during you know late June all the way through this time of year into August. So those are the you know. The, Individuals don't even know they got t they got bit by a tick. So when patients come in um, and you're doing a history, um, you'll ask them often, "Were you bitten by a tick?" And they'll say, "No." Well, they probably were. They just didn't know it. So just being uh, in an endemic area like in Suffolk County, uh, we're exposed even if we don't recall ever getting bit by a tick because you can get bit by a, a small nymph. It's so tiny. It feeds, it's in a, you know, an area behind the knee or, or in the back that you just don't see, and then it falls off. And if you don't develop a rash, or if you do develop a rash and you don't know you have a rash, because not everybody looks at every single part of their body every single day, um, so a lot of times rashes are not appreciated. Um, for example, I had a patient last year who came in with flu-like symptoms, 
um, you know, uh, high fever and, uh, you know, suspected in the summer. If you have flu-like symptoms in the summer, you have to think a tick-borne disease. Asked him, um, Did, do you have a rash? He goes, no, I don't have a rash, but I have a sunburn. He thought, he, he loaded up with sunblock at the beach and he thought he missed a spot. And it was an EM rash in his, like in his groin area. So he did have a rash. So a lot of people don't even realize that they have rashes. The other problem with rashes is in African American or darker skinned individuals, you're not going to appreciate it. It's very difficult to see that typical um, EM or that bullseye rash. So that's a challenge. But right now we're, we're in active season. So this is the typical bullseye rash that I was talking about. You can see that the center, the bullseye clearing around it, and then the expanding red, red ring around that. That's classic. We don't always see the classic rashes like this, but this is very typical. And this helps us as clinicians because we know what we're dealing with. We know that you have to be treated. Even if you are feeling well, I have so many patients that if they do have a rash, I start them on doxycycline, but I'm feeling fine. I don't have a fever. Why do I have to take this antibiotic? Well, we don't want you to get the fever because if you don't do something, if you don't start therapy, we don't want you to have symptoms or get really ill. We want to treat you even if you're feeling well and you have to do the full course of antibiotics. So this is the two-tier test um, for Lyme disease. You have the ELISA, which is the first part, and again, this is not really accurate until a month out, but if you've been treated, this may be, this most likely will be negative. But at 30 days, or sometimes they call this a convalescent serum, um, it's the first test will look for antibodies. If it's positive or equivocal, equivocal then it'll go to the Western blot, which looks at the specific antibodies and the specific proteins. So again, this two-tier test is most commonly used when checking for Lyme disease. Again, the ELISA and the Western blot, these detect antibodies that um, you know, are triggered by infection with the spirochete um, Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay. Again, it's not an early test. So in cases like I, like I alluded to, uh, symptoms for less or equal to um, 30 days, um, it's usually not done, but maybe sometimes we'll do it. Depending on the situation or the case, we'll do it um, 30 days later. Uh, it's if, and again, uh, we're looking for these antibodies. We're looking for IgM and IgG, also IgA as well. But IgM, if you think of those are antibodies. M, I always remember it by M for miserable, sick now, G for gone past infections, it's the easy way to remember it. Um, okay, so with the Western blot, you know, I have a little positives, what is, you know, what does it all mean? It can be very confusing. So this is the, um, the Western blot. Um, this is the second part of the test, and again, um, not an early test. But it looks at the bands, which are the proteins in the cell wall of the Borrelia burgdorferi. And what they did in the studies that they've done is they've taken um, the, uh, the organism that causes disease, and they look at these proteins. And there are some of these proteins that are in more virulent forms of the spirochete. So they are specific for um, the actual Bore Borrelia burgdorferi. So they, we look at the bands, we, we look at the numbers, and usually when we send this test out, this analysis is done for us. So we're not, I'm not when I get a report back, I can look at the bands and then look at the numbers and see which is the most specific for the Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, but usually the interpretation is done by the laboratory, which is very helpful because they do this all the time and they're expert at it. This is a um, PCR. I was talking about another test. It's 
polymerase chain reaction. This is an amplification test. And again, I am a clinical person. I am not a biologist. I do not sit at a bench with a microscope. So this is not my true area of expertise. I am really good at looking at a rash <laughs> and doing a, doing a skin biopsy and drawing blood and, co and collect, I'm being the researcher, the clinical researcher. But this is all, I'm collecting everything so at the back end, at the laboratory, they can, they can figure all this stuff out. But this um, PCR, um, which has been around for a while, it's gotten much better because in the old, old days, a PCR to look for an organism or DNA took like weeks and weeks, but now we can do it in hours, so that's pretty good. But again, for this, for the Borealis burdorferi, because it doesn't stay in the blood very long, it's like, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. If you happen to do this test at the right time when the organism happens to be sitting in the blood for that short period of time, you'll capture it. Otherwise, this test is really not very useful. Um, now, the P, uh, PCR that I talked about is amplifies sections of DNA um, and RNA, which are in, this, in, the, in the organism. They're specific for the bacteria. And this organism, the Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacteria, the spirochete that causes Lyme disease, concentrates in the collagen-rich connective tissue, so it doesn't stay in the blood. These spirochetes disseminate from sites of an infected tick bite via the blood, so it's transported by the blood, but the time that it's in the blood, again, like I said, is very short, very brief. And also, the spirochete load in the blood is also very, very small. So we talked about the PCR, which um, in the blood are fewer than half the patients in early acute stage of Lyme disease with the bullseye rash. So it, it's really not a good test. And by the time the symptoms of Lyme disease have been present for a month or more, the spirochetes are not in the blood. And then we can at least do an antibody test. So search for an early test. Um, the, the study that I'm involved with, we're looking at um, something called isothermal amplification. And believe me, again, I don't sit at a bench under a microscope. Um, but it's basically looking at parts of, um, of the Borealis burgdorferi, the nucleic acid, amplifying that. It's like that PCR that I talked about where it's hard to find. Um, pieces of the DNA or the RNA, this is, this is like PCR on steroids. It's like taking PCR, amplifying like, you know, uh, exponentially. Um, so anyway, this is, so the advantage is, is that this specific technique is extremely fast and it's easy because you don't need temperature changes and that's like a, a laboratory thing, so it's easier in the lab to do. So the criteria for my study um, is that you have to be 18 years of, of, um, or, of age or older. I had to put in 110 pounds because I just got my art investigational review board um, approval and they made me put that in. <laughs> um, rash of early Lyme, and it has to be a rash. It can't be a local irritation. So it's not like, you know, a welt. It has to be, you know, more than a few inches. Yeah, um, antibiotic treatment can be started. I can recruit patients um, who have been on antibiotics for le you know less than 48 hours. That's not a problem. Um, they can't have had Lyme disease for a while. Not they not, can't come to me with chronic Lyme disease. It has to be like uh, early. Um, an early manifestation of Lyme disease. We are not, uh, we exclude patients that have HIV or hepatitis or if, they're at, if they have active cancer. Uh, the patients need to understand the consent. They, un right now, they have to be English speaking. Um, they have to be able to read and they have to be able to understand the purpose and the risks of the study and um, also the benefits. So we do a, cons if I have a patient that presents with a rash, and again, they have to have the rash, and they want, and they're interested in being in the study, um, I have to go through the consent, um, 10 pages long, and I do a questionnaire. I, I can take a picture of the rash, and then I do a biopsy of, I do a very tiny biopsy of the rash. It's two millimeters 
we were for the for we just redid the consent. We were trying to figure out how, in layman's term, can we describe two millimeters? It's really small. We were it's it's because the other consent had la had about a. a size of a pencil eraser, and that's really big, but this is so tiny. It's actually the, um, the width of a nickel we came up with. It's actually, that's how tiny it is. So, and also there's a blood draw, um, and then a follow-up blood draw in three to six weeks. Now, this, um, all of the information um, with a um, research study is that you are, anybody that participates, the blood and um, tissue samples are de-identified, so your name is not on it. You're given a, a number or a code um, you know, to protect confidentiality. Now, the, the great thing about this study is, yes, um, I'm involved in a study looking for an early um, test, but uh, I, with the consent, we're getting permission from patients to share samples. So um, my samples from last summer um, went, um, went to Stony Brook um, because Stony Brook is looking at, an ex um, again, blood testing as well. So um, these are my samples that I had to very carefully um, secure. Um, I think this was in February or January. I used IKEA um, food trays. <laughs> <laughs> and packed everything up. They had to go on dry ice. It was a big, you know, big kind of, you know, thing. And it went to California because that's where the lab did the thermal um, amplification study. So these are my samples that went out over the winter. And then this is in Stony Brook. This is Dr. Bruno. He's probably going to be upset if he knows that his even part of his face is on a photograph. But this is the 14th floor of the towers. You know, when you see Stony Brook, you see those towers. Those are, lots of research is going on in there. It's pretty amazing. I mean, they're doing everything. There's like all these scientists running around and, and whatever. But um, Dr. Bruno is looking at, when I was talking about that two-tier test, he's doing um, an expanded protein, that lipoprotein in the spirochete. He's identifying new proteins. So my blood samples that I collected all last summer, he had part, we were able to give him part of that to, to also include in his study. Because identifying more proteins, particularly if they're more stronger versions of Lyme disease, is very important as well. Because if we can identify strains that are, that are more um, pathogenic, then that helps us treat patients as well and understand the disease and how to manage it. Um, and that, um, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wellens. Um, and our final speaker, and we always ask for some real practical advice, and we found nobody better to do that than uh, Jerry Simons. Jerry Simons is a, a, a physician assistant. He graduated from SUNY Stony Brook's uh, Health Science Center with a degree in cardiorespiratory sciences and went on to graduate from Cornell University Medical College Physist Physician Assistant Program. He is nationally certified as a physician assistant with commendation in both primary care and surgery. Surgery. Jerry is in, an instructor at several major universities, including Weill Cornell Medical College. He's an award-winning international lecturer, has developed educational programs used by physicians, and is a published author on Lyme disease and tick-borne disease. In 2010, he won the national award from the Tick-Borne Disease Alliance. He practices at East Hampton Family Medicine as well as the Morrison Center in New York City. Dr. Simons. Thanks. So I'm going to move around a little bit because I brought my supplies for you guys to look at. But I know most of you have been sitting all day, so usually I ask you to take a survey by raising your hand. But instead, I'm going to ask for anybody who's had a tick bite in the last two weeks, just stand up for us. Let's see some no OK. Stay standing if you've had more than two ticks on you. And what about three ticks on you? And who's on doxycycline or an antibiotic right now? Okay. 
And if anybody just wants to stand up for a minute to circulate, <laughs> you could do that too. Also, I want to take a minute, if you see the guy in the yellow shirt in the back, Brian Kelly from East End Tick, he's another great prevention guru. Raise your hand back there. He helps us out a lot. Round of applause. Great. Okay, good. So I'm going to start off with a uh, pretest. So the most important way to prevent the transmission of Lyme is to have guinea hens. There's a lot of good data on that. During your Hamptons vacation, only go sailing and don't go near any grass. <laughs> Letter C, do frequent tick checks and reapply repellents. D, don't follow insecticide directions. Or E, have kids stay inside and make memes all day. If you have teens with an internet connection, that's a hysterical joke. It's the hottest thing right now. That label up there, you see that yellow and black label, is what we are seeing more and more on different repellents. So whatever repellent you pick, Dr. Campbell talked about the five major ones that we're using now. You can apply DEET at 7 a.m. and expect at 7 p.m. it's still effective for you. So I don't have time to go over each and every repellent, but follow the label and use it appropriately. We already talked a little bit about the life cycle, and if anybody's going to a Hamptons party tonight, there's nothing like saying the ticks are bad because of the winter we had two years ago. Everybody associates a lot of the ticks we have today with the latest winter, but you have to think two winters back. That's the life cycle that is important. So and the other thing that you heard about already is one tick, one tick can lay thousands of eggs. Think about that for a minute, thousands. That's one of the reasons why we have such a big problem. And again, they tend to like to live on animals, but there's so many of us around, we can certainly have a good opportunity there. So we don't need to necessarily review that again. But here's the other important thing, is of course they start off as the eggs, larva, those nymphs, think of the nymph as like that teenage kid that comes over and wants to eat your whole house, right? They're always hungry. Teenage kids are eating everything. And so the nymph is going to get onto animals, squirrels. Guys, don't forget birds, right? One of the reasons why the New York Post had an article last week about Lyme disease in Central Park is because that's a migrating place for birds to land and they drop their ticks. The other reason, when you go to the local hardware store and you see my picture with a wanted ad, it's because I've been insisting people get rid of bird baths, get rid of bird food, get rid of bird seed, because you could be attracting birds and then they're dropping ticks in your yard. So get rid of those things, okay? Pets, when you read my five-page article, there's a nice section on what to do with your pets. But one of my favorite things is you go to the local store or Amazon and you get like 50 of these lint rollers. And when the, before the pet comes in the house, just roll over the whole pet. And you're going to be surprised. You're going to find ticks that haven't been bitten. Plus, it's very cool, you've probably been at the post office and you see somebody with a lint roller clipped on their belt and their cell phone on the other side, because I tell them every couple of hours, run the lint roller over your body, you're going to find ticks. We've already heard from two people that Powassan virus, it's pretty rare, don't get too excited about it, but it has a short transmission time. So the old days of, ah, I got a tick on me, when I get home, I'll remove it. I'm like, no, stop what you're doing and get rid of it immediately. If you haven't gotten one of our famous tick kits, I want you to pick one up and uh, try it out. So that is the cycle. Look at that little Lego, right? Think of how small these ticks are. So again, uh, like Anne-Marie was saying, people come in with a rash. They never know that they've had a tick on them. They're so small. Max was saying that they're the size of a poppy seed. How are you going to see that behind your leg or in your groin or behind your hair? It's really impossible uh, to be able to see that, OK? So prevention is key, right? Because you're never going to know that you've had a tick. 
One of the big messages I want you to think of today, because you're getting overwhelmed with information, but if you can remember one thing, treat your shoes, okay? You buy this stuff called Permethrin. I'm gonna have these items out, you could look at them later. The first Sunday of every month, flip-flops, shoes, treat those uh, first line of defense pretty aggressively with that stuff. That's gonna help to reduce that initial kind of contact there. We know already we're in peak war season right now. May through July are our biggest activities. The second big message that I want you to take off is what everybody on the stage is gonna review tonight. It is, a, it's July, it's a Saturday night. What is everybody on the stage going to do? We're gonna dust off our Harrison's Principles of, of Internal Medicine. It's a two and a half inch book, and they've added a section on Lyme disease prevention. It's only two lines, but they say stay away, stay away from wherever the ticks are. Those tall grasses, those leaf piles, the leaf brush. So, you know, don't walk on the side of the path. Maybe Maybe just save the hiking trip for after Labor Day or the cooler weather, things like that. So be smart. You know, don't get all uh, OCD about it where you literally see people going a mile out of the way because they don't want to walk over a cut lawn, right? You know, I don't want to go on anything green. You don't have to go that crazy about it, but it's important to think about that. So avoid it. Also, check for ticks frequently. You might not be able to see them on the back of your leg. Use that lint roller, for example. And another thing, you know, we, we could all stay here for three hours and just talk about prevention. So the first thing I mentioned there, when you talk to 50 people about preventing tick bites, you're gonna get 50 different ideas. So look at my five page list, think of your activities, and pick something that works for you but make it a layered approach. Avoiding where ticks are, putting something on your skin, putting something on your clothing, use multiple lines of defense to keep the ticks off of you. So again, tick diseases are really preventable. And that famous quote that you see on my handout, one tick bite can make you sick and change your life. So it's important to keep those ticks away from you. There are a few very rare reports that the CDC published um, on transplacental Lyme, someone with really aggressive, a woman who's pregnant with really aggressive Lyme not getting treatment. But again, like Powassan, that's a very rare thing we're not getting excited about. Another report back from the 70s said that Borrelia actually adapt to their local environment, which is why when you get a tick bite in Montauk, you may feel different from someone who gets a tick bite in West Hampton, for example. They have that kind of adaptive behavior, so to speak. So think about that. There's been a lot of interesting studies, but there are studies that show that essential oils, in addition to DEET and permethrin and all of these other types of things, are effective to the point where you see off, right? You go to somebody's house, they have salt, pepper, and off on their dining room table, right? In one way or another, right? They've even gotten into the whole eucalyptus and lavender, and uh, there's actually some good <clears throat> data on using that, especially if you have little kids and you don't want to smear them with DEET five or six times a day when they're going out um, every weekend. So we've already heard, protect your skin and clothing. Permethrin, right? You apply it once, it's good for seven to 10 washings. So that really works good. Keep that on your clothing. <clears throat> Dr. McGinty always talks about our patients that come in with duct tape backwards, the sticky side out. So as the ticks crawl up you, they kind of get stuck there. Lint roller analogy. Um, long pants. Uh, using DEET also, and I've got a couple of versions of that. It comes as spray and wipes and topicals and liquids. So think of where you are, use that layered approach. We already know that um, Powassan and many of these ticks can be a rapid transmission time. There is some data that up to five to 10% of Lyme can come from the tick's mouthpiece. So they bite you, they start getting a blood meal, and they can have that earlier type of transmission. Remember, if you get a tick bite and you follow our advice today and it's removed quickly, the tick is not engorged, it probably hasn't been feeding on you. 
So you don't necessarily have to get uh, too excited about that. So that is another um, important thing uh, that you want to remember. So you're checking yourself and removing those ticks pretty quickly. The Tick-Borne Disease Research Center is still waiting for our, <clears throat> excuse me, our first marriage to occur from these lectures, because I encourage people, you're a single person, it's a Saturday night, you're going to Red Bar, you could say, I went to the Lyme disease talk today and they said I need to be thoroughly checked for ticks. <laughs> so you better come home with me and do a thorough check. So eventually that's going to pan out one day. So. You might need help to have yourself checked as well. One of the cool things that our center does with these kid talks is we have those little glue-on tattoos that we hide on the kid's body, and we make the parents try to find where the tick is, under here, here, behind the ear. So there's definitely some um, surprises there. So you're checking constantly. You're using a layered approach. You're taking my five-page handout, putting it on your refrigerator, scanning it onto your Facebook page, whatever you have to do to remember how to use it. We've already heard that the deer is really exciting. Show of hands, who's seen deer in their yard recently? We could have a whole talk on my not-so-secret love affair with the four-poster system and high deer fencing, but we'll get into that at another time. But it's really the chipmunks, the mice, that are really carrying the disease state. So you want to make sure that those leaf piles, brush, keep things cut around your house to really make sure that you're keeping mice and things like that away. Starting around Labor Day, I put a paper bag in my hallway and I insist that <clears throat> through the winter we save these toilet paper tubes and we will soak them with this yellow bottle, the permethrin, these little cotton balls, and around tax day we throw these around our yard and the ticks, um, the, the mice will grab these little cotton balls soaked in permethrin, bring them back to their nest, and that'll help to kill off these bad ticks. So if you run around with the toilet paper tubes and these cotton balls, and the cotton balls are there, then you probably don't have much of a mouse problem, which is good news. And you don't necessarily want to put these where kids are going to be able to grab them or snack on them, so you're putting them out of reach of little kids. But speaking of kids, I like to buy lots of things with lavender. There's good data that shows ticks hate the scent of lavender, which is why when you go to Kmart or CVS, there's no lavender soap, dryer sheets, shampoos, because people are using those to help keep the ticks off of them, okay? We're still, <clears throat> Sorry, we're still using permethrin aggressively, but I like to take dryer sheets and shove them in my kids' pockets and in their shoes, right? Uh, Dr. McGinty and I were a few years apart in, the, in East Hampton High School, and we have kids, and they're going out in the yard, and we're not keeping them isolated inside. We don't want you to be fearful of the grass. We want you to be aware and be protective, so you're going to use these different kinds of approaches that way. Here's a CDC website clip where you actually see a tick moving around in the winter months when the temperature is over 40. So you're always trying to be careful, right? We're in the peak season now, but you're always keeping it in your mind in one way or another. Another interesting thing is ticks will rarely cross a three-foot wood chip border. So you put that around your house, and that helps to prevent ticks from moving around. So a lot of landscapers will put in that three-foot wood chip border. It's interesting, they've done studies on gravel and rock, and that doesn't seem to uh, work as well, but it's that three-foot. 
So again, the obvious stuff, we're using two layers of repellent. Maybe you're using an essential oil or DEET on your skin, and you're using permethrin on your clothing, you're tucking your pants leg in, you're using duct tape, you're walking around with the lint roller clipped to your belt. Come on, it's a new fashion statement, right? And you're staying away from these tall glasses, okay? And again, the newest thing I need you to tell you is look for that black and yellow label and use these repellents aggressively. And you know what? It's going to come up later in the questions. Jerry, I'm afraid of permethrin. I'm afraid of DEET. And uh, I don't want to use those things. And my answer always is an occasional exposure to these things are better than ending up seeing Dr. Mineroff in the ER or having Dr. Coyle try to figure out why you can't add your checkbook and you've got strange spinal pain. So an occasional exposure is um, mitigating these bigger kinds of risk factors. We've talked about questing and rubbing up against grasses is a high risk time. And certain ticks will smell you, that carbon dioxide plume we talked about. And you're like, how do I get a tick on my lawn chair? I'm like, well, they're probably following that scent. And also, please don't let your dog sleep in your bed. A lot of the repellents that a vet use makes the tick not happy when it bites the dog. So if it tries to bite the dog and it doesn't like it, it's going to fall off, OK? And it's going to be inside of your bed that way. We've talked a little, <clears throat> excuse me, we've talked a little bit about safe removal, but that hypostome, basically that little mouthpiece you see here, gets, can get stuck in you and cause that seven month itch, right? Has anybody ever, ever had a tick bite and like it just doesn't stop itching? That's that little piece left in there. So one of the things we'll do when we remove a tick is we use a little tiny skin biopsy and just kind of Take out the skin with that little mouthpiece, put a Band-Aid on it, and it heals, OK? When you do remove a tick using our tick bite kit back there, you can use, of all the things out there, I like good old-fashioned World War II iodine, right? We use iodine in different ways in the OR to clean the skin. So I say put this on thick a brown color and reapply it every couple of hours. Keeping that skin brown is going to help to kill any germs that uh, might be on there. So you get an old-fashioned bottle of iodine like from the medicine shop. Pets, there's a whole section for you to read on pets. Ask your vet. Cats tend to not do very well with chemicals. So what I want you to remember today, use the lint roller and keep them out of your bed, right? So. Just a few final thoughts, right? Prevention is key. Harrison's internal medicine. Stay away from where the ticks are. Treat your yard. Remove ticks immediately, right? Treat your yard. Get rid of brush. Get rid of leaf piles. Three foot wood chip border. Good. We're going to get to that. We're well, there are natural sprays, there are chemical sprays. That's what Brian helps us specialize in. Get rid of your bird bath and all of those different types of things. Keep your lawn cut short. Guys, in the summer of 2017, a semi-brown lawn is kind of a fashion statement. When you're watering your grass and making it moist, you're attracting things that you might not want to be there. Plus, who wants to mow all summer anyway, right? You may have a tick bite and never see it. Look out for the summer flu, right? And like uh, Anne-Marie already said, if you have a rash and symptoms, you don't necessarily need um, a, lot of blood a lot of blood work. Just one other point, as we said, if you have a rash and you want to help us, come in, let us take a biopsy of it. If you're just fluish and not happy, in East Hampton, we're working with what's called the Lyme Disease Biobank, which is a big think tank in San Francisco, where they take samples of people who don't feel good in endemic areas to study them, both healthy controls and people who are sick. So you're going to treat your yard. You're going to check yourself often. Maybe you're going to have a hot date and get checked tonight. There are lots of different um, 
repellents you can use. I have a chart uh, that's included on there. There are at least four or five studies that show eucalyptus, lavender, and all of those other alternative things actually have some pretty good uh, data to it. So I'll wrap it up, and I think maybe we have everybody stand for like 30 seconds before the Q&A phase, because I know you've been sitting for a while. Great, thanks.